We've seen the degradation and weaponization of the arts, something we've covered many times and for many years at Jay's Analysis and on this channel. But what we've seen in the last few years is the rapid fast forward, the rapid expansion, explosion of the degeneracy. And in fact, what might be called the externalization of the hierarchy, according to some of the top esotericists and occultists, promoted in fact by the United Nations through their Lucifer or Lucis Trust publishing company. The book is, of course, by Alice Bailey. and describes the occult and esoteric secret behind global government. This idea is the notion that now that the goals have been achieved, the hidden plans can now be revealed, actually as part of a stage of the social engineering and revelation of the method. So it's no longer needed to have everything hidden behind the veil of conspiracy theories, behind the veil of the red curtain. Now it can all be laid out in the open. In fact, it can all be thrown in our face. This is a kind of gaslighting where it's all thrown in our face and yet at the same time, none of this exists. If you believe that there's a satanic principle operant in the world, you're a complete lunatic. However, there's also the rights of all sorts of demonic and satanic groups to practice publicly and freely. What we want to look at now, though, is going back, rewinding to the time of Michael Jackson, how he was used by the establishment, and how towards the end of his career, there does seem to be evidence that he was targeted. Uh, this doesn't mean that everything he did was right or that he didn't have issues. We know he was abused by his family. We know that he was put into the role of being the pop star, whether he wanted it or not. And so in this way, Michael Jackson becomes a key figure as the king of pop, uh, in a way, yes, as a successor to Elvis, but as a way to look at and understand the way that stars are made. They're not just organic. Now, many times they do have talent. There's no d denying the talent of many pop stars or Michael Jackson, but their usage in social engineering is what's often denied. And that there's an, an agenda is also denied. That there's a coherent, consistent plan over the decades is denied. And that these ideas, these plans that they might be connected to, secret societies, to intelligence agencies, is certainly out of the question. But again, is it really out of the question? Now that it's all being thrown in our face constantly, every single day, we see the symbols, the imagery, essentially functioning like gang signs for different mafias. The biggest mafias that run the world are the intelligence agencies as the functionaries and busy bees of the banksters that run the world. So not only is the idea of a global occult government true and real, it's in our face every day. And one of the means by which they cause double mind and double think in the population is by throwing it in their face every day and at the same time demanding that you don't talk about it or believe it and if you do you are an insane conspiracy theorist or a religious whack job i want to take you to an area that most are not aware of if you remember the 1978 film the whiz with jacko it stars michael jackson in a wizard of the oz type scenario when they arrive at New York to the Emerald City, there's a ritual that takes place. Not only that, that ritual is at the base of the World Trade Towers. In fact, it is a Masonic occult ritual. Of course, the Emerald Tablet is an aspect of alchemy. Here, the Emerald Tablet is referenced, as you can see, in the Emerald City. And this alchemical transformation that would occur as a result of the towers, I think is clearly suggested in this film. We've talked before about the many, many, many pop culture references to this prior to the actual events. This is just one of many examples, but it's one that not many people are aware of in terms of Michael Jackson. You might think such an idea is impossible. It's extreme. How could there be such coordination? Well, if we think about the fact that most artists, most musicians have handlers, agents, right, managers, people in the background who essentially control much of their careers. Oftentimes, 
musicians, actors, whoever, they do try to break free. They try to go out on their own. However, this doesn't always end well. If we go back to the, the character of somebody like Winona Ryder, her godfather was Timothy Leary. Now, Timothy Leary is interesting because he's an adjunct of the CIA who promoted LSD and the entire counterculture revolution. He was part of that Laurel Canyon scene in a certain way. And as you can see here, he's also a proponent and devotee of Satanist Aleister Crowley. Leary promoted the idea of tuning in and dropping out, right? Get rid of education, get rid of school, take up the path of mysticism and degeneracy, right? the Luciferian pathway. As you can see here, he's pictured underneath a 666 version of Christ or the beast itself. And of course, Crowley referred to himself as the beast. And we see then that he's a perfect example of somebody who might be a handler character, promoting the Crowleyan adage of do what thou wilt should be the whole of the law, while at the same time, he functions as the so-called godfather guru of some of the top Hollywood A-listers. You've probably heard of the 1972 Rothschild Ball. The masked ball featured artwork that was surrealist in nature. Most people don't talk about the influence of surrealism and why it might have been connected to this elite party. Surrealism, of course, is an older dream-based notion of art. The idea that could we blend the divide between the waking state and the dream state. It had influ influences from numerous genres, including shamanism. In fact, surrealist artist Man Ray, a self-confessed esotericist or luciferian is believed to be likely involved in the murder the ritual murder of elizabeth short in the black dahlia case if we look at the artwork we see that it disfigures we see that it mixes up things that don't belong so in other words it's a manifestation of inversion i'm not saying that surrealist art is always wrong but I'm saying that there is a conscious element to this kind or this version of surrealist art that is intended to portray the inversion, to portray the godlike state where one is no longer accountable for their actions. In fact, some surrealist artists even speak this way about their dream state. If the divide between the waking state and the dream state could be overcome, then it would suggest that we aren't accountable for our actions. What better philosophy for those who are the elite? For it combines both the freedom from moral obligation and guilt along with the notion of uh, luciferian inspiration from the dream state the waking state the spiritual realm or the astral realm that's precisely what surrealist art is and that's why salvador dali himself showed up at this party if we think about the 60s we can also consider the important character roman polanski polanski was of course convicted of statutory rape of a minor in 1978 and prior to that had released a host of occultic themed films most notably in 1968 rosemary's baby which prefigures in a loose way the birth of the antichrist the rosemary's baby wasn't his only film that, per that pertained to the occult he also did the 1967 fearless vampire killers as well as if you watch my other video on eye of the devil his wife sharon tate who would be ritually sacrificed in the manson murders starred in this occultic themed film that was eyes wide shut 30 years beforehand on top of that now polanski didn't do eye of the devil but tate was the star of the film on top of that there's the fearless vampire killers and the 1974 film chinatown which deals with the elite and incest and pedophilia Chinatown uh, concerns the elite of L.A., Mr. Mulholland, uh, William Mulray, a stand-in for Mulholland. Mulray in the film is in fact molesting his daughter and has had a child by her. He is one of the most wealthy, powerful men in L.A. I think here Polanski is telling us uh, pretty consistently throughout his films that this is what really goes on at the top of the power structure. We can't forget his 1988 film Frantic, which is overlooked. Frantic stars Harrison Ford and his wife being kidnapped and put into a human trafficking operation. 1999, he put out The Ninth Gate. And the Ninth Gate, of course, stars Johnny Depp as a book collector who is on a quest to 
um, alchemically transform his mind as he achieves Luciferian initiation. If you want a fuller treatment of this, you can read my book, Esoteric Hollywood 2, where I have a chapter covering this very, uh, once again, very close to Eyes Wide Shut themed film. In 2010, Polanski put out The Ghost Rider, which roughly parallels the career of probably Tony Blair, it looks like. Uh, you have the Prime Minister of Britain being implicated in a scandal, murder plot, uh, and it's British intelligence in the background. And uh, I, this, to me, suggests that uh, Polanski knows a lot more than he lets on, and he might even have connections to the intelligence realm. We know that the intelligence realm is uh, fully immersed in Hollywood, and Hollywood is fully immersed in the realm of intelligence. But the reason I bring up Polanski is because he's a seminal figure in the question of occult Hollywood. Spanning all the way through the 60s up to present day, Polanski has pretty consistently made satanic and occultic themed films that aren't just touching on the genre, but in fact thoroughly Luciferian, especially with Ninth Gate. The 60s counterculture wasn't just satanic in the sphere of Hollywood. It also spilled over into the counterculture music scene. If you've read Weird Scenes Inside the Canyon, you know that the Beatles were also involved in the establishment created counterculture of Laurel Canyon. You'll notice here on Sgt. Pepper's that the Beatles album includes the head of Aleister Crowley. That wasn't accidental. The far eastern influences of the Beatles through Maharishi Mahesh Yogi, Transcendental Meditation, was all designed by Tavistock. The Tavistock Institute, of course, being a pioneering institution involved in social engineering. And it wasn't just the Beatles. You'll notice the Rolling Stones album on Her Majesty's Satanic Request includes not only Saturnalian imagery, but also the Beatles themselves. They're actually hidden in the cover uh, from their Sgt. Pepper cover. Indeed, in the 1960s, we're not just uh, counterculture revolution, but were, were in fact a magical mystery tour. The Beatles were telling us much more than just pop culture fun. Uh, it was actually satanic. So in many ways, the Rolling Stones were more revelatory than the Beatles, although both had a definite Luciferian influence in the background with the promotion of the occult, transcendental med meditation, and outright Crowleyanism. If you like this analysis, be sure and go to jaysanalysis.com. The link's below in the description. You can find my two books, Esoteric Hollywood 1 and Esoteric Hollywood 2, Sex, Cults, and Symbols in Film, where I go into great detail in both episodes, 400 pages and hundreds and hundreds of footnotes detailing the real meaning of all the symbolism in film and pop culture. You can get those as signed copies at Jay's Analysis in the shop. Be sure and grab a copy. The Doors also were another establishment creation, along with Led Zeppelin and most of the countercultural bands of the 60s. In fact, Jimmy Page of Led Zeppelin bought Crowley's old house. You'll notice him here with a steli of revealing the Egyptian satanic glyph looking on at a homage to Crowley himself. You'll notice here Jim Morrison's dad, Admiral Morrison, was the man behind the Gulf of Tonkin false flag incident that kicked off the Vietnam War. The Doors also included Crowley on their album. You notice here the bust of Crowley. So once again, there's a common thread through all these bands, whether it's the Beatles, the Rolling Stones, the Doors, or Led Zeppelin. There's all this Crowleyan influence. And while we're on that topic, I want to look at another avant-garde Hollywood figure, that of Kenneth Anger, another devotee of Crowley. You'll notice here his films, especially the inauguration of the Pleasure Dome and Lucifer Rising, seem to predict where Hollywood and pop culture would take America, and in fact, they have. Anger's films like Lucifer Rising and Inauguration of the Pleasure Dome predict a coming satanic aeon, a period in which pleasure will be the ruling principle, immaturity, and the reign of the child, the crown and conquering kid, who is in biblical parlance, the Antichrist. Now, I'm not saying this is necessarily the coming of the Antichrist, but from the perspective of these characters, Hollywood Babylon, one of Anger's most famous works, his famous book, is principally about the new Babylonian age being inaugurated by Hollywood. Hollywood is the pleasure dome, and America will be the means by which this pleasure dome is extended to the rest of the world. 
The 1960s is also the time of the explosion of cults. The Church of Satan came to be the entire revolution of the 1960s. It wasn't just satanic, it was also an engineered satanic revolution. Precisely because those are the top of the pyramid. People like Bertrand Russell, people like H.G. Wells, people like Aldous Huxley. They'd already determined that the cultural revolution would in fact be satanic and it would be a reversal of all the previous traditional worldviews. The new satanic, satanic aeon would include the ideas of transhumanism, Gnosticism, and inversion. In a sense, black magic would become real and it would be mixed with science and it would be a spell basically cast upon the public and the masses, particularly here in America. And then America, as I said, would extend this satanic aeon to the rest of the globe. Indeed, LSD itself was promoted by Leary, as well as the Grateful Dead, as assets of the CIA. This was, in fact, a CIA MKUltra plan, not just for mind control, but also to initiate an entire generation of boomers. If we fast forward past that period up to the 80s, this is where we begin to see the rise of the mass media spectacle pop star. We see Madonna, Jacko, filling entire stadiums for their ceremonies and rituals and nobody really can top madonna for being the queen of this especially given her that her whole act itself is based around blasphemy she is intended to be a an inversion of the theotokos of the virgin mary she is the whore itself she wants to be and in, indeed in many cases embodies herself in the image of the whore of babylon i think it's arguable that uh, she also has Crowleyan influence, even though she may not uh, mention it specifically, the themes of all of her concerts, her ceremonies, being a material girl back in the 80s, all the way up into her modern period of Luciferian Kabbalism, the Kabbalah, which is of course based on Gnosticism and Platonism, also inverts and flips these ideas of good and evil and leads to the notion of ceremonial magic that you can, through rituals, invoke and control both angels and demons. Madonna is therefore, I think, possessed with this Jezebel spirit. She sees herself as in a satanic version of the Virgin Mary. The 70s and 80s also opened up a new branch for satanic genre through metal, and not just heavy metal or hair metal, but actual black metal and death metal overtly and consciously satanic, taking its inspiration as well from Crowley and then branching out into extremely disgusting and anti-human works of art. I think black metal, death metal, etc. have been overlooked uh, as they also gave birth eventually to industrial uh, and uh, self-consciously satanic bands like Marilyn Manson who many times are passed over as uh, shock value theatrical performance art However, in Marilyn Manson's biography, he brags about the fact that his abortions were seen by him as ritual sacrifices. So just because somebody takes something as a showy sort of uh, Hollywood-style presentation doesn't necessarily mean that they aren't at the same time self-consciously satanic. From 2006 on, we would see halftime spectacles, VMAs and AMAs and Grammy shows that were nothing but complete satanic rituals played out before the masses. The reason for this is the attention and energy of the focus of that many people has the power to, in the minds of those who are the ma magicians, the wizards, alter the consciousness of the mass mind in a Jungian sense to alter the collective consciousness or the collective unconscious. So in 2006, we had the nipple slip of Jacko's sister, Janet Jackson, from 2006 on, the degeneracy spiraled out of control. If we think about 2012, Madonna and MIA, we think about Madonna in her overtly Baphomet imagery, we think about Katy Perry and her satanic rituals and her performances, playing the Whore of Babylon again, Ariana Grande blasphemously presenting the Lord's Supper as God is a woman. We think of Katy Perry's Dark Horse performance, which is all Egyptian mystery magic we think of pink in her satanic ceremony as being initiated into the lodge i think of taylor swift underneath a giant serpent there's nothing but pure satanism in all of these rituals all these performances and it couldn't have happened without the preparation 
of decades prior social engineering and cult control. If we hadn't had the 60s counterculture, we wouldn't have been we wouldn't have been prepared for the 2018 blasphemy of Ariana Grande and the rest of these Hollywood hoes. I remember speaking to these issues 12, 13, 15 years ago, and I would be laughed at. And even today, people laugh when you talk about the usage of occult rituals and mass public ceremonies. However, there's no denying the evidence. They throw it in our face every single year and almost every day. Pop culture is not organic. It is a tool of the establishment and it is toxic. If you like this analysis, be sure to click subscribe and give me a thumbs up down below. Also, be sure to check out Jay's analysis uh, and definitely click the bell down below to be sure you get the updates.